Hello, everyone, and welcome to all talk allocating stimulus checks in times of crisis. I'm Aris Palakrist, and this is joint work with John Kleinbeck from Cornell University. We live in a world that's financially interconnected. We get our wages, pay our rent and groceries, as well as perform financial transactions on the web. Today's world is filled with such financial networks, Venmo, cryptocurrencies, banking networks, and PayPal, to name a few. In such platforms, people exchange money in the form of digital made payments and form financial ties. In real life, in all of these transactions can be modeled with a financial network. It's not in the financial network, it's an entity such as a person or a store, and it says represents a liability from one entity to another. For instance, in the slide, we have three nodes, where node one gets $1 from outside of the network, such as being paid a rent, uh, being paid a rent or a salary, uh, owes two uh, to the outside uh, network, for example, for rent and groceries, node two gets two uh, from its work and owes one and two do one dollar in node to node one and one dollar to node three. And node three gets again one dollar from working and has two dollars of obligations in groceries and rent. However, entities also experience shocks in their everybody financial activities. Such shocks result in the decrease of their income and potentially in their failure to pay their debts in full. So entities default to their creditors and readjust their payments. Back to our example, we see that node one assets decrease from one to zero, node two assets decrease from two to one, and node three assets decrease from one to zero. Now node two is able to pay a half to both nodes one and three, which in turn can pay up these to the external network, but again, partially. In all of this, the goal of a planner is to infuse gas in the economy, subject to a budget so that the financial networks can be averted. A very recent example of this was COVID-19 pandemic, where people experienced shocks in their finances, such as loss of employment, loss of rent, etc. In such a case, a government plan wants to contribute stimulus checks of a specific values to the entities optimally subject to a planning budget. The choices of the planner come from a discrete set, namely no one can get either a bailout amount, say $1, for example, or zero. And these bailout policies have been applied during COVID-19, for example, in uh, Greece and New Zealand. Our model starts with a collection of N nodes, whereas liability from a node J to a node I is denoted by BJI. Its node J has external assets CJ and external liabilities BJ that are positive. The total liabilities of node J are denoted by PJ, and the relative liability from J to I is the fraction of PJI over PJ, which we denote with uh, alpha IJ. Each node has an equilibrium payment PJ bar, which we'll discuss on the next slide. And based on the equilibrium payments, nodes are partitioned into two categories. First of all, solvent, where a node can serve all of its steps and the clearing payment equals the total liabilities owed by the node. And default, where a node cannot meet all of its liabilities and has to distribute them among its creditors proportionally. The total relative exposure of a node in the internal network defines the node financial connectivity, which here we denote by beta j, and is the sum of uh, a j i's for all i. Also, we consider random shocks x j with support in zero c j that hit its node and decrease its assets. To calculate the equilibrium vector, one has to solve the fixed point equation. Briefly, what it says is that every node can either pay its debts full or it distributes them proportionally to its creditors. Its node take the element wise mean of the two possible choices and the calculation is repeated until convergence. This model is very well known and is called the eisenberg noy model from quantitative finance. If the maximum relative exposure now within the network, that is uh, beta max, which is the maximum of beta j, is strictly less than one, then the A matrix is a contraction and the equilibrium payment vector is unique by Banach's fixed point theorem. Coming back to the example of when we saw in the beginning, everyone is able to serve their uh, payments and all nodes are solvent. So for instance, here, uh, by computing the equilibrium payment, we see that node one can pay two, node two, node two could pay one, and node three can pay two. And therefore the set of uh, solvent nodes is one to three and the set of default nodes is empty. Assuming now that the SOC hits the network and reduces nodes one assets from two to one, the assets of node two from one to zero, and doesn't affect uh, the assets of node three, we can see that now uh, calculating the you know, equilibrium vector says that uh, node one can pay one, node two can pay 0 0.5, and node three can pay 1.5. And therefore, um, node one should now give 0 0.5 to node two, 
and 0 0.5 um, to the external um, network. And finally, the set of default nodes, of course, is one to three, and the set of solvent nodes is empty. Now, assume that a partner has a budget lambda that's equal to two, and they can allocate a stimulus check of value one or uh, zero at any node. Then the optimal solution here is, of course, to allocate the node, or node one and node two, um, the stimulus checks, in which case the equilibrium is now restored in uh, its initial uh, in its initial state. More specifically, we can formulate the optimal allocation problem with a mixed integer linear programming problem in which we maximize any strictly increasing uh, welfare objectives, such as the sum of payments within the network, the total number of solvent nodes, the sum of payments inside the network, or the sum of payments outside the network, which can be thought potentially of as taxes. We also denote the, uh, the, the constraints that have to do with the bailouts with uh, getting fund. Now, consider the fractional relaxation of the problem of the previous slide. In such case, we relax the values of the allocations to be fractional. So in our case now, node one will get still a value or a bailout of one, but node two uh, can get a bailout of 0 0.5, in which case we can again completely uh, avert the shock. In optimization language, again, the only change we do is that we allow the uh, bailout allocation variables to lie uh, in zero one to the end. As one would have probably already thought, these problems are combinatorially intractable, and the efficient approximation algorithms need to be designed to solve this problem more efficiently. Regarding combinatorial hardness now, it's easy to observe that the discrete allocation problem in question is NP hard by reduction from the three set cover. Briefly, we construct a bipartite graph where sets are represented by nodes on the left and elements are represented by nodes on the right. The sets can provide cash to the corresponding elements they contain, and the set cover of size k is equivalent to a set of allocations that corresponds to the left vertices belonging to the set cover solution and vice versa. Moreover, there is no hope in finding an approximation algorithm for maximizing the number of solvent nodes. For this, we create a cascade as in the picture, and the yes answer again to the three set cover problem corresponds to uh, the set cover nodes and all elements not being activated. And a no answer to the set cover problem corresponds to at most the nodes of the first level being activated. Since this cascade can be made arbitrarily deep, then approximability result follows. For the total payment objective, we design an approximation algorithm by rounding the relaxed solution bailouts, namely we solve the fractional problem, and then we round its uh, its bailout, its fractional bailout with uh, the corresponding Bernoulli variable. Um, we show in the paper that we can update one minus beta max approximation guarantee and expectation, where we remind that beta max is the maximum financial connectivity. Um, but news for this algorithm is that its integrality gap can generally be uh, unbounded. We also propose a greedy hill climbing algorithm, which chooses the node with the largest marginal gain in the objective, and at each step until the budget is exhausted. We also propose a greedy hill climbing algorithm, which chooses the node with the largest marginal gain in the objective at each step until all the budget is exhausted, which uh, we prove that yields a worse approximation algorithm than the randomized rounding, but generally works better in practice. More specifically for the sum of payments objective in expectation, the algorithm yields an one minus e to the minus one plus beta max uh, approximation ratio, assuming that uh, all nodes are default at each phase of the algorithm. We test now our methods using real-world data from banking and semi-artificial data from mobility networks. The full version of the paper contains more experiments with publicly available data from the Venmo platform and more banking networks. You can find it in the archive. First, we consider data from the German banking sector from 22 German banks, where we know the internal and external liabilities and assets from previous published works. Here, we observe that the greedy algorithm outperforms all heuristics and the randomized rounding. The randomized rounding come close to the centrality-based heuristics, such as any vector centrality, page rank, and now degree on the corresponding unweighted graph. We proceed by testing our developed algorithms on semi-artificial financial networks created from mobility data from SafeGraph and data from the US census. Similar data have been used for COVID-19 modeling and designing large-scale reopening policies. We use data from the SafeGraph mobility data platform, which captured the movement of unique cell phone devices between census block groups and points of interest 
that corresponds to businesses such as restaurants, fitness centers, and grocery stores. We focus on the points of interest and census block groups around the city of Ithaca in New York State. The data records the dwelling times of mobile devices for each point of interest from each relevant census block group. We estimate the number of households that comprise each census block group and interact with the corresponding points of interest. From the dwelling time data, we can estimate the percentage of individuals from a specific census block group that are employed in a specific business. Specifically, we consider someone to be employed if its device has an at least four hours dwelling time. We then create a salary age from the point of interest to the census block group. The amount is determined by the average salary for this specific type of business, according to the NIACS classification. Also, for people with dwelling time less than four hours, we add the consumption edge from the census block group to the business with value equal to the combined average consumption for this type of business according to the US economic census. Using US census and NIACS, we estimate the rest of the internal and external liabilities for both the census block groups and the businesses. We remind that we should also be careful to calibrate the network, namely consider subsets of the census block groups regarding those people that interact with specific points of interest in order for the network effects to be non-negligible. Finally, we provide bailouts to the census block groups following the US CARES Act rule for stimulus checks in COVID-19 and using demographic data from the US census. Regarding the points of interest, we gather data from Paycheck Protection Program and calculate the calibrate bailout amount. We observe that the randomized rounding algorithm performs better than the greedy algorithm, and then come all the heuristics that are based on centrality measures of the unweighted graph. Another important question that arises now is the following. Can we impose additional constraints so that we can ensure uh, the fair distribution of bailouts? More specifically, we want to solve the optimal location problem subject to the constraint that the bailouts do not change much on average between related nodes. We impose a maximum value G on the amount of deviation between this application. To quantify this uh, deviation, we use one of the three following measures. First of all, we use the Gini coefficient, which quantifies uh, pairwise inequality for all uh, pairs of nodes, as we already know. Secondly, we introduce a special inequality uh, index, which uh, measures uh, the pairwise inequality between connected nodes in the graph uh, with weights that are equal to the corresponding uh, relative liabilities. Finally, we also consider the property Gini coefficient, which measures the inequality between groups with a certain property, for example, a minority status. We then compare the objective value in the absence of fairness constraints and after imposing fairness constraints. We constrain one of the three proposed fairness measures by an upper bound G for both the fractional relaxation of the problem and the randomized routing. We observe that for all data sets, the price of fairness, which is the ratio of the objective value without imposing fairness constraints over the fairness constraint uh, objective quickly uh, reaches the value of one, which means that uh, fairness and optimality are basically in agreement. Finally, such a framework can extend beyond financial transactions. For example, a place where such a framework is suitable is uh, ride sharing, where nodes represent neighborhoods in a city. Edges represent the number of requested rides between two neighborhoods. Allocations represent vehicles assigned to each neighborhood, and socks correspond to various scenarios such as traffic jams. More generally, a framework is suitable for any problem that corresponds to supply and demand network that uh, at which, when a node defaults, it distributes its resources in a prorated way and we aim to do discrete resource allocation under a budget constraint. More applications include, for example, online payments and computing clusters. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, let's thank Mario for the talk. Um, time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be happy to ask a question. Uh, thank you, it was a great talk. Um, I want to ask about the algorithmic problem. Is it similar uh, to the influence maximization problem, to the problem of a optimal seeding for, a, for information uh, spreading in networks, or are there basic differences? Uh, very, very interesting question. Uh, actually, a lot of the hardness results are very similar to the influence maximization problem. Actually, it was like the source of inspiration uh, for a paper. However, uh, when you try to design approximation algorithms, you can't prove that uh, you have uh, some modularity properties uh, in our case, because basically uh, there is an extra constraint in the problem that breaks, uh, that breaks this kind of structure. So you have, uh, there is this constraint that 
it says that you can if you cover all of your uh, if you cover all of your debts, then you shouldn't pay more. Uh, and this constraint basically like breaks uh, breaks uh, some modularity. So for example, for the greedy algorithm, you have to like get rid of this constraint and redo uh, redo or also redo the analysis. So you you don't get a one minus one very, but you get something that also depends on the financial um, connectivity. And that's why we also tried like randomized rounding for uh, us approximation algorithm. Yeah, but that was a great question, and actually, it was like you know one of the first problems we uh, we saw. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, so I also have a question. So um, I'm wondering, in this problem, can can the solution be game? So let's say, um, like one time, for example, I create some uh, entities and only money to some entities that might be important to the network and also own some money to my own entities. So I have some separate entities and uh, only myself and trying to get the, I mean, the money from, let's say the government or somewhere. And then some part of the money will flow to my own uh, entities. Can one do that and benefit from it? Do you think? Uh, I think uh, in this, uh, yes, in general, yes, generally, and I think there are works that uh, examine uh, kind of like you know incentives in this kind of model. Without, uh, yeah, I think without the presence of allocations, if I remember well. Uh, however, in this case, we assume that everyone you know is like good and they want to like. Uh, Pay all of their like uh, all of their debts, but certainly yes. If you yeah uh, yeah you can lie. I mean you can like report like an interior solution basically to this like uh, region, and this is very interesting in the like dynamic version. So we like if you let the problem like evolve in rounds, uh, we don't really know like you know when if we need the agents to respond optimally every time, so that to like uh, find like uh, outward allocations. Or if they can like report an interior solution at some step, and then in the next step can they can use it to like get basically more like reward 